Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, today, we're going to talk about this remarkable Victorian gent, Norman Lockyer. He was born uh, the year before uh, Queen Victoria came to the throne. And the amazing thing is, Lockyer had no formal scientific training. He started out uh, as an amateur astronomer purely by chance. It was a chance meeting with a chap called Pollock in a railway carriage on the way to where Lockyer went to work. He was in the war office. He was employed as a second-rate clerk. Um, and he was lent a small telescope from which he developed his interest in astronomy and his uh, achievements over his lifetime, including spectral observations of the sun. He discovered helium in the sun in 1868, he investigated sunspots and solar flares. He determined the surface temperature of the sun. Uh, if that was not enough, he was also regarded as a founder of astroarchaeology, the alignment, of course, temples uh, with various astronomical bodies, uh, and the founding editor of the journal Nature. So I'm just going to summarize, really, his, uh, his life in astronomy. When he started out with a small telescope, he realized that few people were actually observing the sun. Even the great astronomer uh, William Herschel believed that uh, dark sunspots were holes in the sun, allowing you to see um, the dark interior. So Lockyer develops his own ideas about how to observe the sun. Now, what had been discovered then is these dark uh, so-called Fraunhofer lines on the, on the solar spectrum um, had been well catalogued by Fraunhofer and Kirchhoff and Bunsen came up with the idea that they all could be attributed to different chemical elements. Uh, and Lockyer states, may not the spectroscope afford us evidence of the existence of the red flames which total eclipses have revealed to us in the sun's atmosphere, although they escape all other methods of observations at other times. So Lockyer came up with the idea of investigating, seeing if he could fish, literally fish for these red flames through his uh, spectroscope. And he writes an article about this in the first edition of Nature. Um, and we've got the first edition on the table outside there. It is their 150th anniversary coming up um, this October. So um, in that article he writes, talking about solar eclipses, it's only within the last decade that modern science has shown to everybody's satisfaction by photographing them and showing that they were eclipsed as the sun was eclipsed and did not travel with the moon that the red prominences really do belong to the sun. Um, it was only 100 years prior to that, Edmund Halley insisted that the red flames were part of the lunar atmosphere. So uh, Lockyer applied to the Royal Society for a grant for uh, an upgraded spectroscope. The first one he used didn't give sufficient dispersion. And success in 20th of October 1868, he captured the first solar prominence of the unobscured sun. And he was able to, to identify the red line of, of hydrogen. What he didn't know at the time was the French astronomer Pierre Janssen um, had also discovered hydrogen, but he had succeeded in doing that in the Indian solar eclipse a few months earlier in August. 18th, 1868. And because he knew where that prominence was, he was able to put his spectroscope on the same point and repeat the observation of the next day. Now, Janssen wrote a letter. Oops. But um, Lockyer sent a, a telegram. And both those discoveries reached the French Academy of Sciences on the same day. And to reward both men, a gold medal was struck, honouring both Janssen and Lockyer, and thus both received worldwide acclaim. 
carrying on, uh, Lockyer then teamed up with Edward Franklin, um, uh, who provide Lockyer with spectra all the, of the known elements. And he goes on to identify sodium, calcium, and barium, and others. But there was one particular line couldn't be attributed to any known element. And this was this bright yellow line. And Lockyer named it after the Greek word for the sun, Helios, um, and he called it helium. Nobody at that time believed him, and he had to wait another 27 years until it was discovered on Earth in the mineral cleavite by the Scottish chemist William Ramsey. So Lockyer had now made a name for himself, um, and he had actually started uh, writing scientific papers in a little magazine called The Reader that he set up with Alexander Macmillan. But unfortunately, that had failed. He suffered a nervous breakdown, but his good friend Macmillan uh, gave him a six-month paid holiday to the south of France. And when he returned, um, he found his job at the war office, his salary is halved. And to supplement his income, he began writing uh, books. And he approached Macmillan and he said, could we start another weekly science periodical? And they decided to call it Nature. And the first edition appeared November the 4th, 1869. And Lockyer remained its editor for 50 years. In the early years, it ne nearly folded, but Macmillan bore the losses, and of course, it's one of the foremost scientific journals today. By this time, uh, Lockyer had been invited. He'd uh, finished his work in the War Office, and he got a job as secretary uh, of the Devonshire Committee. This was a government uh, set up committee to investigate and promote scientific uh, teaching in schools and colleges. Lockyer becomes the first director of the Solar Physics Observatory in Kensington. Um, he uh, amassed lots of scientific equipment that later went on to be the forerunner of the Science Museum, which was, of course, developed on this site. Um, so here he is on the steps of the Solar Physics Observatory. Of his children, um, Jim Lockyer, William James, was the only one who followed his father into astronomy. James Lockyer was a very keen balloonist, an aeronaut. Um, and here he is with Frank McLean, his good pal, who was also a keen aeronaut. Um, and Jim Lockyer was a great aerial photographer. Here's a shot of... Uh, uh, Buckingham Palace, around about uh, 1908. This is a remarkable story uh, about a chap called Percy Pilcher. Uh, look at the year, 1897. This is a few years before the Wright brothers succeeded in powered flight. Well, poor Percy Pilcher developed this hang glider. Uh, Jim Lockyer was the first person to actually make a movie of a man in flight. There is a little movie of, of uh, this chap flying. Now, Percy had developed a motorised version of this. Um, and the day before he was going to demonstrate the maiden flight of his, his powered hang glider in 1897, he took this out and demonstrated that the, uh, uh, the unpowered version. And sadly, the craft stalled and he fell to his death. Had his powered version worked, he would have beaten the Wright brothers by about six years to powered flight. Uh, this is a wonderful, iconic photograph of uh, another co-founder of the NLO, Frank McLean, uh, the controls, and Jim Lockyer, his first passenger holding on tight. Um, there's no health and safety in those days. <laughs> the McLean family were a very wealthy uh, Victorian industrial family. They had designed the Suez Canal. 
uh, Dover Harbour, built the Furness Railway, drained the Fens, and I also understand they supplied most of London with flushing toilets. Frank McLean and Lockyer go out to see the Tonga eclipse. On the way back, they go and visit the Wright brothers, and they agree with them to, uh, well, first of all, McLean buys uh, a total of 13 aircraft off the Wright brothers. And he agrees to set up the Short brothers, who had been making their balloons, um, to make uh, the Wright flyers under license. And Frank McLean says, don't worry, any aircraft that you don't, can't sell, I will buy. So Frank McLean ends up with 13 aircraft, he donates three to the Royal Navy and is hereafter known as the godfather of the Royal Navy or the Royal Naval Air Service. This iconic photo shows um, uh, Jim Lockyer and Frank McLean in this is called the Pioneers of Aviation. This was at Laysdown on the Isle of Sheppey where Frank McLean bought some land uh, to build a small airstrip and where the Short Brothers uh, had their little factory making these aircraft. In the front row, you've got Wilbur and Orville Wright. Um, this chap here, this is Charles Rolls of Rolls-Royce fame, who sadly got killed a year later by uh, Bournemouth Air Show by diving too steeply in his right flyer. These are simply wooden uh, structures and the tailplane broke off and he crashed to his death. Maul Brabazon was the first UK guy to get uh, a pilot's license. Um, he famously took a little pig up in a wicker basket to prove that even pigs could fly. <laughs> No, we're not being able to... There we go. Frank McLean also made this historic flight through his float plane through uh, the Tower Bridge. Um, it was actually meant to be done by a French flyer. Unfortunately, his aircraft tipped over in a gale in, in, uh, on the Seine. So the Daily Mail phoned up um, uh, Frank McLean and said, can you do the flight instead? So Frank, Frank McLean takes off 8 o'clock in the morning, flies up the Thames, under Tower Bridge, and lands outside the House of Parliament uh, to make a statement that the aircraft were more versatile um, than the airships. Um, when he landed, uh, the river police came up and found him a pound for causing a breach of the peace. <laughs> so now we come up to 1913. Um, Norman Lockyer was at the grand age of 76. He'd actually fallen out with the committee because they had planned to move the Solar Physics Observatory to Cambridge. Um, Lockyer didn't really want that to happen. He had a place lined up at Foster Down in Surrey, but he got overruled. Um, so he retired to Sidmouth, where his second wife... Um, owned a lot of property. They built their retirement home at the bottom of Salcombe Hill and they bought land at the top of the hill uh, where his friends, uh, or certainly Frank McLean, gave him £10,000. Uh, and Lady Lockyer, Lockyer had then been knighted by then. Um, Lady Lockyer gave 4000 and they built two domes, one holding the 10-inch uh, Kensington refractor and Frank McLean donated his wonderful 10-inch refractor that his father had, had owned in his back garden in Tunbridge Wells. So in those days, it was called the Hill Observatory, and it had two main telescopes, um, and the whole organisation was run by the Norman Lockyer Corporation. Uh, the main work was... Uh, getting spectral images of the stars. And these wonderful old telescopes were, fit, were fitted with objective prisms. This is the Kensington telescope. Um, 
How he got hold of that, we're not quite sure. Uh, whether it was a parting gift uh, to satisfy him or whether he just nicked it, I am not sure. There's certainly a bit of a dispute about who actually owns it. Um, the Royal Astronomical Society believe they do. The uh, Science Museum believe they do. But Patrick Moore said, no, uh, the Norman Lockyer Observatory own it. So it goes on site. It's actually in a listed building, um, so I think there it will remain. This is Frank McLean's 10-inch refractor. Um, and again, that is a twin tube refractor, one with a prismatic camera with the objective lens and a plate camera at the, at the far end of the telescope. So most of the spectra we've got, um, this is a typical plate. Um, and of course, the spectra is a, a way of decoding starlight to determining a star's composition. And this is the spectra of Nova Cygni um, in 1920 on different dates showing the the changes in the spectral lines. Lockyer also uh, went on eight different eclipse trips. He writes in his book, Recent and Coming Eclipses, there is no question the total eclipse of our central luminary is one of the grandest and most awe-inspiring sights that given to man to witness. Um, here he is in one of his eclipse trips. Uh, this is, I think, out to Egypt. There he is with a cigar in his Panama hat um, and all his team of observers around him. It was a major task going on an eclipse trip in those days. He would take a team of about 200 personnel. But whereas we think, uh, uh, don't give a second thought about jumping on an aeroplane and arriving at your destination a few hours later, of course, in Lockyer's day, you'd have to load your horse and cart go down to your port, on board ship for two or three weeks. You take all your personnel, your um, masons and your carpenters and your canteen staff, security personnel. It was a, a major undertaking in those days. On one of his eclipse trips, he also had time to investigate um, a lot of the, the, the temples, particularly in Egypt, um, and he wrote the dawn of astronomy in 1894, successfully dating the temple of Karnak of 3700 BC, based on the historic rising position of, of Sirius. Of course, Sirius was a very important star for the ancient Egyptians. When they saw that rising before the sun in about the third week in June, um, twinkling in a blue sky, that was a signal that the Nile was going to flood and mark the start of their calendar. Lockyer then went on to survey uh, many ancient sites in Britain and he shared those interests with his second wife, Thomasine Mary Broadhurst, whom he married in 1903. He died August the 16th, 1920, on the 50th anniversary edition of Nature. And the NLO uh, was renamed, well, the Hill Observatory was renamed the NLO in memory of its founder. And, of course, Jim Lockyer builds his little airstrip there. He's uh, venerated with a, a small crater on the moon that sits on the, uh, the larger crater Janssen. And... James Lockyer died in 1936. Um, it was the Norman Lockyer Corporation continued running it until they ran out of money in the 1970s when it was taken over by University College of the Southwest, which uh, eventually became uh, Exeter University. They had planned to sell it off, but the good people in Sidmouth didn't want that to happen. They raised £300,000 in a couple of months, gave the money to East Devon District Council, who then purchased the site. Um, so we had a new planetarium built in 1996, a Donald Barber Lecture Theatre, uh, commemorating the last paid astronomer at the NLO in 2006. A wonderful planetarium, a Spitz AP3, was donated by the Royal Greenwich Observatory. 
Um, and another building that we did manage to build recently is the Connell Dome. This had originally been planned for 1914, um, but the First World War in intervened. It was never built um, until 2012, uh, where it's now housing a 20-inch uh, reflector. Um, opened by Dr. Brian May in 2012, who agreed to be our patron following the death of Patrick Moore a few years ago. So the NLO today, we have open days, school visits, we do our GCSE astronomy, and the actual membership is split up into various different interest groups. Here's our famous uh, refractor, the Cook refractor, in regular nightly use, as is the Kensington and the McLean. The observers group here, occasionally we do get clear nights on Friday and we uh, put all the telescopes to use. We have an astro imaging group, spectroscopy section where we can take spectra of comets, supernovae using little um, star analyzer gratings where you can work out the actual expansion rate of the, uh, in this case, blue shifted. You will be worked out the shell was expanding at 12,000 kilometers per second. We have an NLO meteor detecting station in the Lockyer Technology Center, whereby we're <coughs> getting reflections from a uh, a powerful radar station in Dijon, the south of France. As the meteors come in, they ionize, um, ionize the, the atmosphere, which acts as a signal, a reflection, a mirror that sends signal to our receiver, and we get a signal <coughs> appearing on the screen. We've got an all-sky camera, and we've also got Two, one facing north and one facing east, where we're, we're videoing uh, meteor, meteor, meteors and fireballs. Um, the data is collected and sent to UK Meteor Network, where we can triangulate and work out the orbits of these things. We also have a history group. Um, our oldest archives is, is Lockyer's collection of spectral plates. Uh, we've got many of the, the spectral plates were rescued by Dr. Elizabeth Griffin from uh, Cambridge University. And we're currently fundraising for a project to have all of these scanned with the help of the Exeter uh, Digital Humanities Lab. Also recently, we've had a return of the Mon Astrograph um, and we hope to reinstate that over the next year or two. Solar observing, we've got a wonderful solar telescope donated by the late uh, John Pope, who was one of the principal engineers for the William Herschel Telescope, um, ex-NLO member who died a few years ago. So these are some of the pictures we can take through that. We've got a very low frequency uh, detector for solar flares. Um, so when you get these sharp fins appear on this very low frequency signal communicating with submarines, uh, you can, the X-ray emission causes perturbance in is it the D-layer, I'm not sure, and we get a, a sharp fin up here so you can detect your uh, solar flares. A uh, very uh, keen group of young Astro Scouts, probably about 20 now. Uh, we're not teaching them to drink, we're making uh, solar graphs, pinhole cameras, uh, showing the track of the sun over six months. And they very recently built this wonderful model of the moon. You press the buttons and the craters illuminate and so you can identify a different crater. So they made that all themselves. Uh, very recently we built a new uh, building, a classroom called the Gene Edivian Centre, 
uh, largely funded by the late Gina Divian, uh, who gave us a lot of money and enabled this wonderful new facility to be built. Last Saturday, we had a sort of family day incorporating Colleton students here. Uh, so their hands-on science department. And here's some of the things we get up to, our astronomy fair. Sydney Science Festival, and now we're coming to the end. Oops. Thanks for listening. I hope to see you all at the NLO.